Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11113 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Court Reform Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11113. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11113, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11117, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to the business programme for today. Any member who wish to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11117. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11117, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to topical questions. Question number one, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking regarding the future of Long Annett Power Station. And that's our Fergus Ewing. Officer, the Scottish Government has regular dialogue with Scottish Power, with the UK Government and National Grid about Longhanet Power Station and its contribution to our energy security. Last week, Scottish Power announced that it has not put Longhanet forward for the UK Government's capacity market auction, one of the potential mechanisms for supporting the continued operation of the plant. I have written to the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Ed Davey MP, seeking urgent talks on the future of Longanet and the implications for wider energy security. I have also spoken to Neil Clitheroe, Scottish Power's CEO of Retail and Generation, who stands ready to join these talks. Given the off-gem capacity margin warnings for the coming years, presiding officer, and given the vital role that Longanet plays and that there are 260 people uh, employed directly at the plant that will be looking for certainty, I would urge Ed Davey to come to the table as soon as he possibly can. Annabel Ewing. I, I thank the Minister for his uh, answer and I would ask if he shares my view that the UK Government's unfair transmission charging regime is now putting these 260 jobs at Long Island at risk as well as of course the local supply contracts and I ask the Minister to do all in his power to ensure that the UK Government work with the Scottish Government to safeguard the future of Long Island and all these vitally important jobs. Minister. Well, I think we, we all across the chamber are concerned about the future of uh, workforce throughout Scotland and those at Longanet will be especially concerned because of the difficulties identified by Scottish Power. Annabel Ewing is absolutely correct that in Longanet, the Scottish generator, Scottish Power, do pay a disproportionate penalty in transmission charges and that that amounts to an additional £41 million a year for every year as compared with the charges which they would incur were they generating electricity in, for example, London, where they would actually be paid, I believe, £4 million to contribute to the grid. So given that that disparity, given that that discrimination affects generators in Scotland, this is a very serious, albeit not a new problem, and one on which I've advised this chamber on several previous occasions. Ms. Ewing. Hey, thank you, um, Can I ask the Minister further to that reply if he can spell out what the consequences will be if the UK Government now fails to review its policy and baseload capacity and also fails to reform this uh, discriminatory charging, uh, transmission charging regime that has been in place for far too long? Minister. Well, I, I thank the Member for a question. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned to guarantee success. And I'm concerned to work with the UK government in a constructive fashion insofar as we, we can do so. Uh, I hope that it is a shared analysis that the continued operation of Longanet is essential to maintenance of security of supply in Scotland. Longanet provides voltage stability. In the event of a total loss of power, then Kruachan would start up first and then Longanet. And Longanet plays a pivotal role in the security of the grid. And that, I believe, is something 
as a non-engineer that National Grid recognised. So what I'm concerned about, presiding officer, is to get a solution. And of course, in finding that solution, as energy is essentially a reserve matter, the ultimate responsibility does rest very squarely with the UK government. But I want to work constructively with them to identify, find and deliver that solution sooner rather than later. Cara Hilton. Um, I'm pleased to hear the Minister say that he's going to work constructively with the UK Government. Obviously, in recent years, Scottish Power has invested over £200 million in Long Annet, and that sustained hundreds of jobs in Kincardine and thousands of additional contractors' jobs in my constituency and beyond. In his discussions with the UK Government, will the Minister commit not only to stressing the strategic importance of the site, but also to recognising the skills and commitment of my constituents who were responsible for keeping the lights on to two, more than two million homes last year? Minister. Yes, I, I think those are very fair points that Cara Hilton has been made. I will most certainly stress these points to uh, Ed Davey just as soon as we can uh, meet together to discuss that. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the jobs are extremely important. And of course, the challenges that they face are very substantial, as I found when I had a very lengthy meeting at Longanet uh, some time ago. And I learned the very substantial investment of £200 million that has been made in order to render Longanet compatible with EU requirements over emissions and emissions reduction. So I think some credit should be given to Scottish Power for a massive investment to reduce the emissions of, I believe, SOX and NOx, uh, sulfur and nitrous uh, oxide and other chemicals, and therefore they are to be credited for that. But the fundamental problem, which Mr Clitheroe identified in his press release presenting also last week, is this. Scottish generators account for 12% of generation capacity connected to Britain's high-voltage electricity network, but they pay around 35% of the charges. That makes it extremely difficult for them to offer guarantees about the future, and that is the problem which I, I wish to help solve over the coming weeks. Margaret Fraser. Thank you. Uh, in addition to the question of the transmission uh, charging regime, which the Minister has mentioned, there are two other fundamental issues affecting the future viability of Long Annet. One is the EU uh, emissions regulations that he has referred to. The other is uh, the question of carbon pricing proposals. Can the Minister tell us what his view is on these two other issues? Minister. Well, Mr Fraser is correct that these issues are um, uh, 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 serious ones, and uh, I discussed these in detail with, uh, uh, with Scottish Power when I visited Longana, and they do make uh, the continued operation of Longana more challenging. Uh, but I do believe that there are options to find a solution. I understand that the national grid spend in the region of presiding officer, and I'm waiting confirmation of this in writing, uh, but in the region of a billion pounds, 1,000 million pounds a year, in order to maintain grid stability. Now, it's not for me to say what precise amount would be required in order to bring about a solution and long -term certain, longer term certainty to 220 at least for Longanet. But it would be a very small proportion of that budget. And therefore, the opportunity to derive a solution by means of a bespoke contract is one which has existed for some considerable time. And it's sad, perhaps, presiding officer, to reflect that it's only after Scottish power puts these matters into the public domain that matters see some real progress coming forward. And it's necessary to go to the press in order to galvanise those who are involved in coming up with solutions to do that. I understand that Scottish Power will be meeting with the National Grid next Wednesday. And I will be meeting with the Scottish Power directly after that. And I will most certainly be meeting with National Grid, with whom I have already made absolutely clear over a long period of time in this chamber, in committee, and with National Grid. They must find a solution they should have found it now, and they will have to find it in the next coming weeks, or there will be a more serious debate in this chamber about how Scotland's uh, generators are treated in the UK. Question two, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what role it has in ensuring the safety of nuclear power stations. Minister Fergus Ewing. Prime Officer, powers over nuclear safety are reserved to the UK Government. The Office for Nuclear Regulation, the ONR, has specific responsibility for regulating safety and security at the nuclear license sites in Scotland. 
However, the Scottish Government is responsible for consequence management and engages closely with the UK Government and the ONR to ensure robust resilience plans are in place. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. We shouldn't be alarmist about the Hunterston cracks, but it does make the overwhelming case for a full environmental impact assessment and public scrutiny of any decision to extend the lifetime of these plants. The Minister and I corresponded in July about the ESPO and our house conventions, both of which make it clear that even if no new works are required, the public should be involved in decisions. Will the Government support a full environmental impact assessment of any lifetime extension for nuclear power stations in Scotland? Minister. Well, first of all, Presiding Officer, let me just confirm that the Office for Nuclear Regulation, to whom I spoke this morning, have confirmed what they have made absolutely clear. And they have provided, as the regulator, an assurance that there are no immediate safety implications affecting Hunterston B and that it is safe to continue generating electricity. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think that the, the safety issue has been dealt with by the regulator. Um, Ms. Johnson refers to whether or not there should be a process of a, a, a more a wider environmental impact. I can assure Ms. Johnson that the consideration of the environmental case was made when the life was extended to 2023, an extension which was made two years ago and which has been fully discussed and reported in this parliament already. In addition to that, and in addition to the life extension case, it is a, a, my understanding of the process from my discussions with the ONR this morning and previously that there is a periodic safety assessment. And the next periodic safety assessment will be due to be uh, carried out in 2016 or thereby. Uh, I can also assure Ms. Johnson that the defect which has been found is not unexpected. It is something which, on the contrary, was expected and to be expected and known about both by EDF, the operator, and by the ONR. And I say that simply because I'm sure that we would all agree that no one in this chamber would wish to be unduly alarmist about highly technical matters where the regulator has been very closely involved working with the company, and indeed I spoke to a representative of the company as well this morning on this matter. Alison John. Thank you. Um, EDF estimates that the graphite bricks have lost almost 13% of their weight. The current safety limit is 15%. But EDF do appear to be able to go to the ONR and ask for this percentage to be raised. They've done exactly that in Kent. What role does the Scottish Government have in such decisions to lower safety thresholds whenever a nuclear power station appears to risk being in breach or whenever the lifetime is extended? Minister. Well, you know, we, we take these matters extremely Seriously, it's not simply a matter of what powers we have. All of us are concerned to ensure that uh, safety is properly maintained in all its aspects in all the, across the electricity generation world. And we have received an, an assurance that that is the case from the ONR. I was determined, presiding officer, myself to obtain that confirmation of that assurance this morning. That's why I spoke to a senior representative of the ENR, ONR uh, this morning. Uh, what uh, I would also state, presiding officer, is that I suggested, and both EDF and the ONR have agreed, that uh, with your permission, they will hold a briefing for MSPs after the October recess. Scottish Government officials will be involved with that. At that briefing, they will answer all the questions that uh, uh, Ms. Johnson and all other members have. They will be transparent about that. I hope to attend that briefing myself. It will be held uh, during the parliamentary session, but not during the plenary session. And with your permission, presiding officer, all members will be able to ask these questions directly of both the company and the regulator involved. Uh, I think that the willingness of the company and the regulator to accede to my suggestion this morning uh, does demonstrate their good faith. And I look forward to taking part in that session when it takes place, I suspect and hope, in November. Thank you for the advance notice of the intention to have um, such a session. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank the Minister con for confirming that uh, Hunterson will continue to be closely monitored to ensure it remains operationally safe for the expected duration of its working life, which is expected to end in 2023. 
But can the Minister confirm that if there is any possible threat to public safety, remedial action will be immediately taken? And that if, in the interest of safety, Anderson B has to close sooner than 2023, hundreds of people would continue to be employed at Anderson through commencement of a decommissioning process that will last for several decades at least. Minister. Well, I appreciate that Mr Gibson, as the local member, has uh, been assiduous in, in, in representing the interests of his constituents who work at Anderson, not least when we attended together in the event where we opened the uh, where the education centre was opened and when we went on a tour of the plant. And the plant is accessible to all members. Uh, Mr Gibson asks a series of questions about what may happen in, in relation to uh, Hunterston in future. Uh, the facts at the moment are that the life extension was fairly recently granted 2023. A very rigorous process is in application. I'm satisfied with that. The Scottish Government are regularly, regularly in contact with the company uh, uh, and the company is willing and is happy to have uh, an open and transparent approach. So uh, I am hopeful that uh, although difficulties arise, they are dealt with in a business-like and efficient way uh, and that none of the eventualities which the member raises will in fact occur uh, and that the station will continue to operate effectively and safely throughout the remainder of its anticipated life. Ian Gray. Thank you, Officer, the um, First Minister uh, recently wrote to EDF, the operator of Hunterson, admitting that we need our nuclear fleet well into the next decade since uh, the two stations generate uh, just under half of our electricity. It's very welcome then to have heard from the Minister today the public reassurance that he has given uh, on the safety of Hunterson and its capacity to continue to generate electricity. But would it not have been better if the Scottish Government had issued that reassurance yesterday, uh, rather than have the Deputy First Minister uh, call this uh, issue hugely concerning, uh, simply contributing to the alarm which the uh, Minister himself has said we need to avoid? Isn't the problem that, as always, the Scottish Government are trying to face both ways at the same time when it comes to nuclear power? Minister. Well, if I stick with the facts, presiding officer, the facts are that uh, ever since I uh, was uh, uh, appointed to this post, I've made it clear that there is a continuing role for nuclear generation in Scotland of the existing power stations. That is something that was made clear uh, from almost the outset of my tenure since 2011. It comes as news to people who don't follow the official report, presiding officer, usually MPs, not so frequently MSPs. Uh, and of course, the real challenge is quite simply this. Uh, I mean, we expect Hunterston to continue to generate to 2023, and of course, uh, Torness within Mr. Gray's own constituency, which I've also visited, um, provided they can do so efficiently and safely, we support that, and they play an important part of the grid. But the problem is this, uh, presiding officer, the nature of the transmission charges in Scotland being 35% uh, of the total with 12% of the generating capacity means that were we to seek to replace thermal generation, for example, then how would any company investing hundreds of millions of pounds choose to invest in a place where you have to pay an extra 40 million pounds a year? Yeah. I mean, no one has answered that question from either of the UK parties. And until and unless they do, they will not get anywhere with these political arguments because those are the commercial realities and those are the commercial realities that haven't been addressed by the UK government over the last decade. Question three, Jimmy Hepburn. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is in the Conservative Party's plans to repeal the Human Rights Act 1998. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, the Scottish Government is strongly opposed to any attempt by a future UK Government to repeal the Human Rights Act or to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. The Human Rights Act exists to protect the interests of everyone in society. The safeguards in the Act have been actively used to protect the everyday rights of ordinary people in Scotland, including by helping some of the most vulnerable in society to challenge iniquitous policies such as the bedroom tax. The Scottish Government's position is that implementation of the Conservative Party's proposals would require legislative consent 
and that this Parliament should make clear that such consent will not be given. Jamie Hepburn. Does the Minister share the concerns expressed by Professor Alan Miller, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, that the Conservative Party's plan is, and I quote, irresponsible, undermines the rule of law, sets a dangerous precedent to other states and risks taking us backwards when it comes to protecting people's rights in everyday life? Yeah. Minister. Well, of course, Professor Miller is absolutely correct to issue uh, that warning. And over the last week, we've seen some highly irresponsible proposals and statements from people who hold high political office and, frankly, who should know better. Attacks on human rights must never be used as a cheap political manoeuvre by any party. David Cameron and Chris Grayling are running scared of UKIP and pandering to the Europhobic extremists within their own party. And they don't appear to care about the damage they are doing. These are dangerous proposals which threaten the rights which all of us enjoy. If they were ever implemented, they would inflict immense damage on both the UK's international reputation and on international efforts to protect and secure human rights around the world. We could hardly lecture other people if we're not prepared to abide by those international rules ourselves. And Scotland, frankly, deserves better. The rest of the UK deserves better. The international community deserves better. And the influence which Scotland and the UK have in the wider world means that we in this Parliament have a responsibility ourselves to show leadership on this issue and to make clear that what Chris Grayling is proposing is simply unacceptable. And that is something on which the overwhelming majority of members of this Parliament, I am sure, agree. Thank you, President. Officer. The Minister alluded to the fact that last year a, a woman with multiple sclerosis was successful in challenging uh, Glasgow City's Council's decision to apply the bedroom tax uh, against their own human rights grounds. Does the Minister share in my concerns that such recourse uh, could be stripped away if the Human Rights Act was scrapped? And isn't this a perfect example of why the Human Rights Act uh, uh, matters to us all? Minister. Of course, a, a precise example of the danger of the changes that uh, seem to be being uh, proposed. Chris Grayling uh, said in the document on Friday that what he wants to do is limit the use of human rights laws to the most serious cases. Of course, we haven't got a list of what those most serious cases might be uh, or, or what might be, in his mind, trivial cases. The paper goes on to say that the use of the new British Bill of Rights uh, will be limited to cases that involve criminal law and the liberty of an individual, the right to property and similar serious matters. There will be a threshold below which convention rights will not be engaged, ensuring UK courts strike out trivial cases. Well, of course, what might be trivial to Chris Grayling might be a matter of near life and death to an ordinary human being in our society. And it does sound very much like an excuse for depriving the most vulnerable people in society of hard, enforceable rights. It sounds like a mechanism for removing the right to challenge unfair and unjust policies, like a plan to silence dissent and prevent inconvenient court rulings that demonstrate just how ill-conceived and damaging policies like the bedroom tax are. And that's not just my view. It's not just the view of the Scottish Government. It also happens to be the view of some very big names within the Tory party itself. Ken Clark has voiced precisely the same concern. And this Parliament cannot allow it to happen. It is a principle which should unite us all. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister consider there's an opportunity here to sort out some of the not insignificant problems that have arisen from the incorporation of ECHR into the Scotland Act without fully appreciating the unintended consequences? Minister. Well, I, I notice that the member hasn't uh, bothered to give us any specific examples of what these specific problems might have been. Uh, I, uh, I do believe. I do believe that occasionally governments can be made uncomfortable by decisions uh, that are made uh, uh, elsewhere in terms of human rights. But in a sense, that is as it should be. And I recall in the early years of this parliament, a then justice minister being warned frequently and vociferously that the slopping out process in our prisons would simply not stand in terms of human rights, but nevertheless chose to take the budget for fixing it away, and then lo and behold, ultimately went to court, and of course, it did not stand. It is not as if we don't understand, often in advance, when things are going to be a problem, uh, and we should be able to try and look forward to fix them. Sometimes governments will be discomforted by results. But if a Bill of Rights, if human rights did not occasionally discomfort governments, what on earth would be the point of having it in the first place? 
Thank you. The next item of business is a stage three proceedings on the Court Reform Scotland Bill.